Lima, the capital of Peru, has become the center of a revolution in gastronomy, with top chefs here basing their cuisine on ancient crops, which are only produced by traditional farmers. For generations, these farmers have been sidelined and forgotten. Yet now they are the only ones who hold the key to a huge variety of sought-after food. Back here in the Andes, farmers grow varieties of potatoes that were never even heard of outside the region but now they are regularly supplying some of the world's top restaurants. A ver, ¿qué nos han traído? Uh, let's see what we have here. Look at these beautiful potatoes. Wow, nice. Pedro Miguel Schiaffino is the creator of Malabar, one of the highest rated restaurants in the world. And he prizes Peru's ancient potatoes, not only for their taste and variety, but also for their nutritional value which he says is becoming far more important to people. In the future, people will concentrate on eating better, not eating more. And it's not just what people are eating that's important to these chefs, but how it is grown. Today, top chef Ivan Kisik is in the Andes, 300 miles away from Lima. He is riding out with fellow chefs and farmers to pay homage to Mother Earth. Not long ago, this area was a base for Maoist insurgents, a place of violence and bloodshed. But now there's a new kind of revolution, a solidarity between the chefs and the people who grow their food. For many years, we chefs have found it really unfair that the principal producers who make it possible for us to cook and to have food on our tables do not have a decent life. And this is what's driving the chefs to call for change. They want to ensure that these farmers can continue to produce traditional crops and at the same time make a decent living. This is also the goal of IFAD, the UN agency that finds ways to help smallholder farmers earn higher incomes. And according to the organization's Maya Portola, what these chefs are doing has had a huge impact, not just on the farmers, but on the stability of the country as a whole. If we think about Peru as a country 20 years ago, we would have thought that it was a failed state. The food revolution that, is, that we're experiencing now has really given the country uh, an opportunity for building peace and for contributing to social inclusion. And now people living in uh, the most remote places in Peru, uh, they have a sense of self-worth which they never had 20 years ago. And through this food revolution, Peru's chefs are leading the debate over the future of food and farming. The most influential, Gaston Acurio, owns a number of top restaurants around the world, and he promotes cuisine as an agent of social change. Today he's at Peru's Native Potato Festival, a chance for him to emphasize the important relationship between chefs and farmers. Clearly, we as chefs are in a privileged position, and it's our duty to make sure that those involved in the chain have the same benefits, opportunities, and successes that we have. Potato farmer Edoberto Soto agrees that farmers and chefs need to work together. I believe the most important thing for us is to seal this alliance based on the same approach, values, and trust between farmers and chefs. And with this new alliance and mutual trust, traditional food and farming now has a role in shaping Peru's future. Landlocked by quarrels and neighbors, Armenia has taken a while to rise to the challenge of the market economy. Modernizing has been slow going here with high food and fuel prices, unemployment, and an aging infrastructure. The conflict in Syria is bringing back faces from the past, too. At the end of the Ottoman Empire, more than 100,000 Armenians fled to Syria. 
Now, Syrians of Armenian descent, around 8,000 so far, are fleeing to their homeland. Many, like Maral Narbandi, have never been there before. With only the clothes on their backs and few prospects for work, it's a bittersweet homecoming. Thank God we managed to flee Aleppo safely. There were so many who died from bombing bullets and snipers. You could not even stand like this in the street. We escaped safely and now we are here. Still, our future is ruined. What is awaiting us here? Maro found a job in a cafe where she works 12 hours a day, six days a week. But it's not enough to pay rent and buy food. So the World Food Program plans to help her and 5,000 other Syrians staying in Armenia with food like rice, lentils, flour and oil for six months. She says she wants to return to Syria when the fighting is over. But in the meantime, she has a roof over her head, food for her family and safety. From across the Turkish border, Mount Ararat looms over Armenia's capital Yerevan. On its summit, 7,000 years ago, they say, Noah's Ark finally found refuge. In this stormy region, its presence has again become a symbol of hope. Uganda is a landlocked country. Yet 60% of the population's daily protein requirements come from fish, the majority caught here in Lake Victoria. As the second largest source of foreign revenue, the fishery sector makes a vital contribution to the economy, and it's the implementation of national standards based on the Codex Alimentarius which ensures safe fish for locals and successful export of Ugandan fish all over the world. The Codex Alimentarius Commission was founded 50 years ago by the Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations and the World Health Organization. Its objective is to develop harmonized international food standards, guidelines and codes of practice to protect the health of consumers and ensure fair practice in the food trade. The standards are enforced right from the capture of fish, make sure the boats are clean, they are, the fish is handled properly. At landing sites, we have improved structures where fish is landed. We have potable water, see that it's used for cleaning the, the places where fish is handled. Uh, the transport boats, every time they are transporting the fish, we make sure they have ice. Uh, the trucks, which collect fish from landing sites to processing plants, they also use ice. And at factory level, we make sure they comply to the standards required, the temperatures, the handling places, and also the labeling to make sure it can be traced back to where it originated from. Gertrude Nabukera runs a landing site on Lake Victoria and understands better than most the importance of codex standards. She started with one paddle boat, and struggled to keep going during an export ban in the 1990s. But the implementation of national standards revived the sector, and now business is booming. Gertrude has 300 fully equipped vessels and provides employment for hundreds of people. Quality standards of the fish must be promoted. We all know that fish must be kept safe so that consumers don't have health problems. And then the international market benefits too. It's boosting the economy and the population's nutritional status. And Uganda's thriving fishery sector is paving the way for growth in other agricultural sectors too.